Ladies and gentlemen, the Blockchain Basics series is back in action, and today we're talking about one of the most critical components to any decentralized application and smart contract application out there today. We're talking about oracles. So without further ado, let's hash it out. Now, if we're just now meeting, my name is Forrest. I'm a smart contract and decentralized application developer in industry. And I created this channel to help people learn about this awesome technology and awesome movement that is around cryptocurrency and blockchain. So if you wanna see more content like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the little bell notification button so we can hang out every single time I post a new video. Now, as a smart contract developer and someone who builds dApps for a living, I'm always trying to figure out how I can put good data into my smart contracts so that they can make decisions about where money or ether is actually going. In software engineering, one of the main rules is good data in, good data out. If you put good data into a contract and the contract is written correctly, a good result or the result you're expecting should come out. However, if you're putting in bad data or you don't have data in the first place to make decisions, well, your decentralized application is not gonna be that useful. And to make matters even more difficult, when you're building a decentralized application, you don't have the ability to make rapid changes to the code if things don't go well. And anything that happens on that blockchain is immutable and unchangeable regardless of what happens. Despite their name, smart contracts aren't smart and they're not actually contracts. They're just pieces of code that live on the blockchain and execute on certain conditions and logic that the smart contract developer has built. Without good data to make decisions about what should happen, which transactions should occur on certain conditions, the smart contract can't do what it's meant to do. And that is to be a conduit for the movement of ether and other cryptocurrency or the execution of certain logic or ownership of crypto assets. So if you were building a decentralized application using a smart contract to automatically pay out on people betting on horse races without having some way of getting horse race information or the winners of each race into that smart contract, it can't make the decision on its own to determine who the winner is. And if that information that you provide is wrong, for example, the wrong person could get paid out and there's no way to back that transaction out and then redo it on the blockchain. It's immutable. This is where oracles come in. And oracles are really just a fancy name for external services that feed information into a smart contract. They feed data onto the blockchain for a certain purpose. And there are different implementations of oracles. There are different ways that you can use oracles. But the easiest way to think about it is if a contract needs to make a decision about something that's happening in the real world, like weather, like the result of a sports game or a race, like information from a certain IoT sensor that's measuring temperature on a piece of fruit in transit, all of those things have to be fed into the blockchain somehow and they have to be validated in some way. So with an Oracle, we need two things. We need the ability to get a certain amount of data from outside of the blockchain and feed that in in an easy and secure way. And we also need the Oracle to perform some sort of action as a trusted data source. We need the ability to maybe reconcile multiple different sources of information and then feed that in as one stream to the smart contract. So we can have a high confidence level that the information we're getting and we have one chance of doing right on the smart contract is correct. Now, like I said before, there are many different flavors of oracles and different approaches, but by and large, these oracles are really accomplishing a couple of things. First, they're pulling information from multiple different sources. So let's use the horse race example. So let's just say there are four or five different separate public APIs that supply the results of horse races for different applications out there in the world. There are probably way more than that, but let's just stick with four or five. An oracle platform would likely take four or five, all of those sources from the APIs, they would collect them and compare the results from each of those sources. And in this case, these oracles are software oracles. They're pulling data from multiple sources, in this case for horse race results, and then they're taking all those results and either averaging them together and trying to figure out what the correct answer is before it supplies the data into the smart contract. And when I say they're trying to determine which information is correct, let's think of an example where there are five of these public APIs for horse races, 
Four of them say that horse A won the race, and then one says that horse B won the race. This reconciliation could be as simple as best three out of five. So in this case, four of the results say one, horse A is the winner. And then only one says horse B is the winner. So in this case, what gets supplied to the contract by the software Oracle is horse A is the winner. So you can pay out the winners based on horse A. Now there are also methods of reconciliation that include weighted averages or reputation scores, complex cryptography. And there are a bunch of different approaches to this. We're not gonna go into every single one, but just know that the main job of the Oracle is to take a data feed from multiple sources, collate that into one final decision, and then pass that information into the smart contract for whatever execution of logic there should be based on those conditions. So you can think of these software oracles or these pieces of technology as gatekeepers for smart contracts. They're there to supply a trusted data source to a smart contract and to prevent bad data from getting fed in in the first place. Now work has to be done to prevent these oracles from becoming the very rent seeking middlemen, the controlling centralized party for decentralized applications because they very well could be. You have really, really, really important job as an Oracle to supply information to a contract, which makes them a target and a potential centralizing force within a decentralized application. Now on the other side of things, you can also have hardware oracles. You can have physical oracles. And often these are probably referred to as IoT devices or Internet of Things devices. People nowadays have all sorts of IoT devices. You have smart sensors in your fridge to tell you when food might be going bad because the fridge's temperature is too high. You also have smart toasters, smart ovens, smart everything that feeds information to servers to make decisions. You can remotely control them, do all sorts of cool stuff. But everyone also knows that IoT devices in their current state are a hacker's delight. They're not very easy to secure. The information is flowing across public channels more or less, and so it's not great for privacy either. So in this case, hardware oracles are a little ways away until we can figure out a way to securely manage this data and manage these sensors. But we're still gonna talk about it because it's interesting. But first of all, let's talk about an example where a hardware oracle could potentially be useful in a decentralized application. Let's just say in the future that Amazon integrates with Ethereum so you can pay for all of your grocery deliveries via one hour prime delivery using Ether in a smart contract. Now let's also say that inside your cheese drawer, you have a couple of specialty cheeses that you really, really enjoy, assuming you don't have a dairy allergy. And through the, the sensor inside that drawer that measures the temperature that that cheese is being kept at within your fridge, makes a decision of whether or not you need to order more cheese, right? If the temperature goes up too high for too long, it will automatically notify you that that cheese is now bad, you need to get rid of it and automatically order more. Now a hacker might take that and say, well, what we're gonna do is, we're going to hack into that sensor, we're gonna trick it into thinking that the temperature is okay indefinitely, so you eat rancid cheese and you get sick. Or if the hacker were truly vicious, they could raise the temperature above the threshold several times after new cheese is ordered and indefinitely keep reordering new cheese until they've drained your wallet of all of its ether. Now, I'm sure you're thinking, well, that's not all that useful then if everyone can easily hack it. And the reason why I started with the counter case is because I think the attention needs to be given to the fact that there's potential here, but only when sensors are managed properly. One of the ways that we can defend against this type of hack is to provide a best three out of five or five out of seven consensus on any data that's being fed into a smart contract through sensors. So essentially the sensors will reach consensus on what data should be sent first, and then that data gets sent along to the smart contract for decisions on whether or not to purchase. So in order for the hacker in the fridge example to effectively hack you and make you purchase new cheese, it would have to take over five sensors or three sensors the majority of the sensors, hack all of them, manipulate the results to then send the fake result or the false result to the smart contract. This is a much more difficult type of hack, especially if each sensor is of a different make and model, so the hacking mechanism is completely different for each one. There are also ways that you could establish cryptographic proofing for data that it's on the sensor once it leaves, making sure that it wasn't tampered with between the sensor and the smart contract. There are a ton of different ways that you can start to approach this problem, and I'm really excited to see what happens with that in the future. 
I really do believe that shortly we'll be seeing data markets where data is purchased and sold and constantly rated with reputation scores and paid for on demand through certain decentralized oracles. The key here though, is that we prevent oracles from becoming centralized, singularly controlled entities that feed data into smart contracts. Because if that's the case, prices could be ratcheted way up, data could be controlled and manipulated by individual parties, and that's just not something that we want, especially when we're trying to decentralize applications rather than centralize them in the first place. Now, there are several projects out there working on this type of technology, and the most prevalent of them would be Chainlink, which there are many fans, and those are definitely worth taking a look at to see what the current state of oracles are. With that, guys, please do not forget to subscribe to the channel, and I appreciate that very much in advance. And of course, there will be more content linked up here on the screen for you to click. Thank you very much. Cheers.